Welcome to Health Tech Matters, a podcast brought to you by the Pankhurst Institute at the University of Manchester. I'm your host, Videya Sharma. Hey, Videya. Hi, Lamise. How's it going? Very good, thanks. Great to see you. And you. So you spoke to Dr. Joe Firth. Absolutely. It was a really, really interesting conversation. Joe's a well-renowned academic, brings lots of experience and expertise to the table, and it was really, really fun to, to spend some time with him. Great. Well, I've been working with Joe for about a year now, and he's uh, a great person to work with, as well as being prolific. <laughs> Absolutely. He's published so much, but on a topic that I think perhaps historically has not been on the on the table as much, talking about the importance of physical health in patients with mental illness. Certainly, I've been really getting into that myself. We've been doing lots of work together, looking at mortality rates um, due to COVID amongst people with serious mental illness. That sounds super interesting. Joe talks about these topics as well. And he also talks a, a lot about the importance of diversity and inclusion in academia, which is, again, is a topic that's really close to my heart. Yeah, and nice to hear a Northern accent, I guess, too. Absolutely. Right, well, I'm excited to hear the interview. Let's get into it. Dr. Joe Firth has a background in psychology and completed his PhD in medicine at the University of Manchester in 2018. His research explored the relationship between physical and mental health, and he has already contributed to over 200 peer-reviewed publications. He recently chaired a Lancet Psychiatry Commission on the role of physical health in people with mental illness. We further discuss the role of digital therapeutics in contemporary healthcare and how people with mental illness in particular can benefit from technology-based interventions. Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you on. Um, so, Joe, you've accomplished a lot in your dynamic uh, career as a researcher, and it's clear that you're passionate about the intersection between physical and mental health. I want to start by asking how you got into this field and why it's so important and what excites you so much about this topic. Well, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I initially got into this field when, well, before I was even into research, I was a support worker with young offenders with mental illness, young ex-offenders living in a rehabilitation project. And at the time, um, I was really into exercise as well. And one of the activities I used to get people doing was like the fitness sessions and things, which wasn't really offered as part of their, you know, traditional care, even though everybody was taking medications and, and other things like this and other therapies were available. Exercise wasn't really a component of it. So I, I started doing the, the exercise stuff just really as a fitness thing rather than a mental health thing. But then just getting the feedback from the people who were receiving the exercise sessions made me more interested in the interaction between physical exercise and mental health. And then at the same time, uh, my twin brother, actually, I've got an identical twin. He was doing his PhD on uh, just on bird research, really, in Oxford, but just telling me about how much he was enjoying his research and things. So I thought I'd look, have a look for PhDs and saw one around exercise for youth with psychotic disorders in Manchester, applied for the PhD and yeah, just carried on in the research career since then. Um, after a short while, I, I moved over to Sydney for my first fellowship after finishing my PhD and became more interested in the whole broad spectrum of different lifestyle behaviours and how that is associated with physical health outcomes and mental health outcomes for you know improving outcomes in people with mental illness. That's fantastic. It's great to hear how you took like a lived experience of actually interacting with, with patients and, and those suffering with, with mental illness and was able to channel that into, into a career that, that then sparked your interest and, uh, and drove your, your career forward. I know that one of the um, recent highlights um, of your, of your post-PhD time has been um, leading a Lancet, digital, uh, a Lancet Commission on protecting physical health in people with mental illness. I love to hear a bit more about this experience. How did they reach out to you? What was it like coordinating, you know, world-renowned experts on a, on a focused topic? And can you tell us a few points about what came out of that piece of work? Yeah, sure, yeah. So for people listening who are not really into this field, the, the physical health of people with mental illness is becoming increasingly recognised as, as almost a human rights issue. It's so terrible. People treated for severe mental health conditions die 15 years younger than the general population primarily due to physical health conditions, not due to the, you know, the suicide or, or mental health causes. And it's really just because of the, you know, unfortunate neglect of physical health um, and, and how it's not really properly resourced in mental health care. So we, we see a massive gap in life expectancy and that affects people right across the entire life 
lifespan. Even young people coming into mental health services, we see a very fast decline in people's mental health when they're treated with antipsychotics, for instance, which have large metabolic side effects. So this, so the Lancet commissions, they all target, you know, very big, important areas of, of health. So it was fantastic to get one commissioned on this topic. The other ones are like on dementia or antibiotic resistance or, you know, these really big population health topics. So it's good to gain that type of traction for a, to- a topic that's increasingly recognized, but still quite niche and in, in need of further awareness and, and more so action. So we started that in, in 2019 and it was a big international effort with like 42 different co-authors, international experts from all, all different fields and piecing it together took quite a while. The, the full report of the initial commission was uh, published online so people can check that out if they're more interested and that actually speaks about the need to make use of digital technologies to kind of fill this, this gap in, in physical health care in the context of mental health. Um, and, and now we're actually recommencing the commission. The, the Lancet team have just been back in touch with me to ask if we can do some like follow-up pieces, looking at how you know the research has developed, technology has developed, integrated care has developed in order to provide some new solutions. And, and especially post-COVID, where things have gone you know more online and, and more remote, how we can um, make, make use of these developments in mental health services to continue addressing the gap and the physical health disparities for people with mental illness so it's an ongoing commission really that's great no it's here great to hear that you've been uh, contacted by them again to, to follow up on that and i think as you say that um reflects the fact that it's a, an increasingly important uh, topic that's being um given the, the correct amount of attention now picking up on uh, what you said around um raising awareness for um physical health in, in patients with mental illness do you think there is something around the wider healthcare infrastructure so not just mental health services, but perhaps the wider health and social care services that need greater investment around um, mental health or greater awareness across the whole spectrum of of healthcare services? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's two major issues at play, really, from a service level. And and one is kind of like the um, arbitrary dissection of healthcare into mental health and physical health services. And it's a shame, you know, everyone in the general population knows how well um, physical health is connected to someone's mental health. People know that from their own experience. And we see, you know, declines in physical health co-occur with declines in, in mental health. It's it's all very connected, but unfortunately our health services are not set up to be connected to address that. So that that is one problem and, and that can be... Um, counteracted a little bit with integrated care models but you still need quite proactive efforts to engage people with mental illness in long-term physical health care and, and lifestyle interventions as well and then secondary to that the, the mental health care services are probably the most under-resourced and overstretched services in the nhs in england and we see that and similar in other countries as well uh, especially places like america with the insurance models and people with mental illness from deprived communities are very unlikely to get even mental health care so then expecting a decent level of physical health care to be provided in the context of mental illness is is almost impossible um so yeah it is, it is really about finding creative new solutions if we're going to ever address that that's great and i think perfectly picking up on on thinking about creative new solutions i know that some of your recent research has, has focused on the role of digital technologies to support people living with mental illness can you tell us a bit more about this landscape and perhaps give us some some uh, interesting use case examples yeah sure yeah so since since closing the the first commission um i've i've, I've since commenced a large ukri funded program of research which is all around using digital technologies to improve the integration of physical health in mental health care and my area is specifically focused on the early intervention services so the young people treated for severe mental illness with the idea being it's it's actually much easier to if if a physical health condition like diabetes or cardiovascular diseases are foreseeable and somebody's at high risk of them it's a lot better really if you can intervene early and provide the right care to prevent those from arising rather than you know waiting for somebody to get overweight diabetic and and have heart disease and things and then trying to reverse even though that's obviously important it's it's ideal to prevent it really so uh, we're starting a whole new program of work around trying to make use of digital technologies the first year or so which we've just completed has really just been getting a lot of service user feedback engaging patients in um, perspectives gathering exercise on how they see digital technologies integrated into their care working with clinicians we've done some qualitative interviews with clinicians and surveys and things to see what clinicians would see as actually feasible for implementing into clinical services because that's so important you can have the best technology in the world but if the clinicians are not really interested or don't really see that as accessible 
to be part of care, it'll never get to the patients anyway. So they're kind of like the gatekeepers of technology in terms of patient care. Um, yeah, and, and and around the training as well. For, that's really one interesting thing coming from the clinician feedback is uh, there are a lot of people in the NHS work care coordinators, psychiatrists, psychologists who are interested in these approaches but don't feel like themselves have had the right training to know what to recommend or how to recommend it if they're the ones who should be setting up the patients with it or if it's somebody else can take that role. So around the need for training and stuff, we've learned a lot around that. So we're going to be advancing that a little bit more formally. Uh, yeah, so, and, and then now we're moving on to a whole new interventional program of work around like digital smoking cessation programs. We've got a trial on that started at the moment, an online fitness thing that we're going to be starting soon and then looking at healthy weight management in in the near future so keeping busy and it's only a small team so we are very busy <laughs> no it sounds like it and it sounds like there's a lot of work going on and and a lot more to do and um, picking up on a couple of the, the last points you made around these new digital therapeutics or apps as part of treatment of of uh, mental illness or addiction do you think they will ever replace traditional face-to-face or pharmacological treatment or do you think they'll be an adjunct and what kind of pitfalls do you see when it comes to designing these digital interventions? Yes. Well, I think mental health care, due to the nature of the conditions that mental health care is designed to treat, is important to stay as in-person as possible, really. Digital technology should be used to augment um, or automate processes that don't need to be in-person. And then also add on to care facets that we don't see. As I mentioned earlier, really the physical health and lifestyle interventions are not currently part of mental health care. So it's not about taking them from in-person to remote or whatever. It's like about having even none at all or, or remote because it's not really feasible to deliver some of these interventions at scale um, without making use of digital technologies. In my previous work, I've done you know full trials on using exercise in early psychosis. We see the benefits. We get people going to the gyms. We see improvements in physical health. We see improvements in mental health. And then the minute the trial stops, the intervention ceases because it's not really feasible to keep it up. So if we're really serious about implementing it as part of real-world care, then probably my belief is that digital tech is the only way to go. And as we see digital technologies being used more and more across the population, in for health and fitness you know the general population are making use of these technologies with you know wearables fitbits all different types of apps online fitness classes um it'd be a real shame if once again the mental health populations kind of get left behind you know of these advances that we're seeing in the general population mental the mental health populations are the most at risk of getting left behind unless we start researching now ways to implement it as part of those care processes as well Absolutely. And I think just as you were talking, the the topic that came to my mind was um, the risk of digital health widening health inequity, uh, which is something that we see not just in patients with mental mental health um, challenges, but also patients from lower socioeconomic groups or ethnic minority groups. Um, And they have been shown to have reduced rates of adoption of technology based interventions. This is something sometimes also known as the, the digital divide. Do you think that we should be concentrating on um, research and um, ideas of how we can reduce that gap rather than widen it? And do you think there are any particular ways that we can approach this challenge to, to do that? Yeah, that's a really interesting point of debate or point of consideration around the low adoption rates or, or less availability and accessibility of these digital technologies in the most underserved populations. And sometimes that kind of can trigger the response, maybe in the clinical teams or, or in the carers or patients. It's kind of like, oh, these interventions are out, out of reach for our service users, so it's no good, you know, let's do something else. But my, my response to that would be, no, 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 the fact that it's out of reach is more of a reason why we need to invest in the research, see how these things can be accessible and engaging and at what level if they should be actually provided as part of care, you know, if it's improving someone's physical health outcomes, even the cost effectiveness, let alone like the the human benefits of that is, um, you know, is is massive potentially if we can reduce multimorbidity and mental illness. So really the research is the most important thing in that field to see how we can make it accessible and engaging for people of all populations rather than just say that group doesn't really benefit from it at the moment. So let's just leave them be. (laughs) This podcast is brought to you by the Christopher Pankers Institute. The Christopher Pankers Institute is part of the Health Innovation Manchester ecosystem. It's a partnership between the University of Manchester and the NHS, public sector and industry. 
Our mission is to make positive change in health and care for all through multidisciplinary and collaborative development, evaluation and implementation of new health technologies. We love to collaborate. So if you have an idea or would like to come on the podcast, please get in touch. I'd love to get your your viewpoint on this challenge when people talk about research in the digital health space or, or academic research more generally and the challenge of translating that into a real world application or perhaps products or bringing things to market and there seems to be a often a gap between very great interventions that may have had lots of evidence base behind them lots of papers lots of research but never actually make it into a real world application and the converse is true of apps tools things that people can download use on a daily basis that don't have any academic rigor behind them at all how do you think we can um, overcome that um, uh, disconnect between academic research and real world application do you think yeah well i think the main thing that we first need to just honestly acknowledge is that the traditional methods of academic research and medical research in particular large-scale rcts is not really compatible with high-tech interventions at the cutting edge because by the time you've even funded an rct by the time you've even got the ball rolling the technology that you'll be testing is definitely going to be out of date so then like you say you end up with two camps of interventions we end up with the evidence-based interventions that have been trialed extensively and shown to be effective but then when you actually look at the app nine times out of ten it's terrible you know it's it, well it's just not up to date with the current standards of what we'd expect from a health app and then you get the other side which is just developed entirely by the tech people and it's not evidence-based, but, you know, it seems a little bit more engaging. It seems a little bit more fancy with the bells and whistles, but who knows if it actually actually works. So it is more about gelling those those be- the benefits from each field together. And we do see some really good examples of this. The, the best in my mind right now would be the app Sleepio, which has been trialed extensively, but then the technology, the, the core principles are always present in the app, but it's updated so regularly. You know, it's very graphical. It's very animated it seems up to date it's as good as any other app in terms of its functionalities and yet it's still evidence-based because the team have been pursuing they've not seen the rct at the end of it and now just get it in the nhs they've seen that the whole process is iterative they've been working with service users and care providers to say how can we actually keep it relevant how but and also evidence-based and now i think that is probably the first example i can think of of a lifestyle app that's actually become part of nhs guidelines recently that's been um recommended rather than sleeping pills you know for people presenting with insomnia to their uh, primary care physicians so it's it's yeah it's good to see some people doing it right and then for everybody else i think it is really about integrating the tech companies with you know we don't we don't have to shy away from our industry partners for too long the 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 tech partners are going to be absolutely imperative to making sure the technologies that have been tested uh, are uh, evidence-based and also up to date Absolutely. I, I really enjoyed what you said there about that thinking, which comes great more in industry rather than I think in academia about having that continuous feedback loop and that continuous desire to improve your product. Um, whereas in, in academic research, sometimes it can be more of a linear process from, from start of research project to end and then it just stops. Whereas there is definitely a need to be able to go back to the start and say, hey, gosh, we've done this, but how has that made a change and how can we We'll look at this again to, to continue to iterate. So thinking a little bit more about um, about academia then uh, and thinking about how we can make an impact with regards to the, the work that we do. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, academic writing? You've published a, a lot of lot of academic papers in a wide range of journals. Do you have any tips or pointers on, on publishing or, or writing for research that may be earlier in their careers? Yeah, well, Publishing is hard. It is a, is a barrier to to entry really for academic careers as well. It, I'm seeing now more and more like even PhD applicants are needing papers, published papers or submitted papers on their record before even getting in to academia, and it is a tricky subject. Um, and there's no really one f- one size fits all answer for improving publishing, but there are some there are some tips, there are some key, and there's some key not to do as well. And it's obviously, if you're trying to get more publications out there, which is important, not just from, you know, like the ego side is a big thing in academia, everyone wants a name out there, put that on the back burner, focus on uh, an important topic. If you've got something that you know is very important, publishing on that will be easy for one for the way that you write about it it'll be reflected that you understand the importance of the subject and then also the wider audience if it's a 
uh, and important and distinguishing between an important topic and an interesting topic you know lots of people are doing very very interesting research but without that importance not every it's not really going to be competitive for those few small spots in the top journals which everybody's obviously competing for and submitting their research there make sure you're focusing on something important or at least pitching it you know the importance aspects uh, of your research um, putting them at the forefront and then second of all it's all about teamwork makes a dream work with publishing really a lot of my um, success I guess you'd call it in that area has been from the team that I work with you know they're all very prolific researchers they're all very passionate and dedicated and we work as a team no one's trying to get to the front of the queue you know obviously you, you, you can lead a project without trying to lead the people and it's quite natural for you know, we talk about leadership and academia and things like that a lot. And, and junior researchers or people trying to rise the ranks, so to speak, think it's all about leading the leading the people, you know, but it doesn't really work like that in academia. D don't try and do that because then ultimately you're trying to put people below you in the academic hierarchy that is immutable, you know, and it is, it's unfortunately it does, it does run on that model still. In my opinion, it's an old fashioned model with the first authorship and all that type of stuff. I think we need to move more towards consortium authorships and things like that, but that's another topic. For the time being, focus on leading a project and people will happily get behind a project and you can lead that if you're doing something important, even if other people are leading their own projects, they'll happily contribute to, all, to yours. You'll be able to get experts involved and you're never really trying to put your foot down and say, I'm leading a group of people because you're just leading a project and everyone's allowed to contribute to that or join in with that or leave that however they see fit. So I think there's, those are two areas that people need to be conscious of with um, importance over interest and then trying to lead projects over people is good ways to, you know, put your best foot forward in terms of publishing. I love that. I really like that. That's really, really good advice. And one of the other uh, topics, I guess, that kind of goes in line with that um, revolves around diversity in, in academia. So as you said, there's, you know, barriers to entry into academia, not just from a uh, academic expectations or excellence perspective, but also there is a um, topic around perhaps a lack of diversity, particularly in senior academic roles. Do you think that that is a potential um, disadvantage to creating high quality research that is actually reflective of the challenges in our society? And together with that, how do you think we can improve that diversity at, um, I guess, at entry level, but perhaps also more importantly at senior levels? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think there is real, real barriers to entry and a lack of diversity in, in academia, probably at all levels, um, around various different classes and, and and the way that you've categorized people up. A really obvious one seems to fall with regards to like people from very working class backgrounds and, and not privately educated. I think are massively underrepresented, and especially in terms of mental health and and severe mental illness, it's the un it, you know it's the underserved communities. Unfortunately, that have much higher rates of mental health conditions but then with in the field of psychology for instance and the phd graduates probably even now i know it's people are becoming more aware of it over time and and people are taking steps to address this but realistically a lot of the research um is being conducted by people who might not be representative of those backgrounds and you know it's good that it's i, I wouldn't say those people shouldn't be doing the research but it's also important to make sure that the you know the entire spectrum of that group is well representative in the people making the discoveries and another important thing around that is making sure even separately to the professional staff that the um, service users of the actual mental health care services are involved in the research and that will massively improve the quality of your research if you're working in any field this doesn't just apply to mental health in my opinion anyone trying to do health research the more that you can get involved with the service users of those healthcare services the more impactful and important your work will ultimately be. And it'll make sure you're not wasting time. I've been on paths before that would have ultimately been basically a waste of time, you know, until you speak with the service users about it and they'll say, you know, that's a bad idea. And as, as hard as that can be to swallow, you know, you can put the academic evidence to the side for a minute and just think, okay, yeah, forgetting the science, um, if something's not going to work in the real world for that group, um, focus your efforts elsewhere. So it's 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 even beneficial for, for any anybody of any level to make sure you're involved. All, all groups really absolutely and certainly something that that we find um in our groups as well that co-designing with service users or even with healthcare professionals delivering a service is critical to be able to design solutions that actually meet intended benefits and and uh, and particularly in, in digital health um, bring the benefits of technology to patients so just coming towards the end of our, our discussion then as um you know an emerging leader in, in digital health and, and mental illness 
where do you see the landscape moving towards in in the near future? What do you think's on the horizon? Well, I guess for you personally, with regards to your journey, but maybe also um, in in the wider ecosystem, any particular projects that you're excited about, or any um, emerging uh, discoveries that that come to mind? Well, yeah, what I'm really excited about is digital health presenting an opportunity to do what to reverse what we were saying at the beginning, really, in the separation of physical and mental health care is now so built in to our traditional health care services. It's almost Im- impossible to imagine them gelling as, as much as we'd hope, even though we are trying to increase, you know, the communication and integration between physical and mental health services. But digital health, it's all new. It is providing a new landscape, which could actually, you know, for, from its very inception, be providing physical and mental health care, looking after the well-being of the users, the psychological well-being, just as much as the physical well-being, providing new insights into the way that our physical health, um, you know, varies with regards and our physical and our health behaviours varies with regards to our mental health on a day-to-day basis. We're now going to get much more fine-grained data on all these types of things that have previously been impossible to study, new interventions that can be delivered at scale. So I do think it will present a number of opportunities to provide this real overall holistic care that's previously not really been possible. Great, fantastic. I love that. So we've got a potential clear playing field that we can start off with, uh, whereas in other areas we may have to change the legacy of, of previous decisions, whereas now with digital health, we may have an opportunity to set the bar high from the start. From the start, That's great. Thank you so much, Joe, for, for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you, and we'll hopefully see you soon again. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, then tell your friends and colleagues. And don't forget to hit follow so you don't miss future episodes.